Divine Choice Book Group. These are discussions of books selected by Jesus and Mary. This book group discusses Through the Mists by Ephra and Robert James Lees. This is Chapter 17, A Poetess at Home. Hosts of this discussion are Mary and Jesus. This discussion was held on the 23rd of April 2014 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 1, Part 2. Next up in the chapter, she actually says something which is very close to what we are just discussing. She says, I cannot say, neither am I in a position to understand if any of our friends were to try to explain it to me. So, because... What heaven's really like. What yeah. heaven's really like. Mm -hmm. It is impossible to clearly comprehend that which we have not seen. And the attempt to do so only fosters incorrect in conceptions. Mm. I cannot see, so I am content to wait until my eyes can bear the brightness of the revelation. In the meantime, I have much to learn and, so, and many sweet enjoyments to gather on my way to holiness. Mm. So um, mm. she's really saying that exact same thing again, isn't yes, she? Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's why he says, then you think that there are still other preparatory stages? And, you, <laughs> and she says, of course there is, of course there is. <laughs> like, you know, of course... To get to any new condition, there needs to be something that prepares you for that condition. And God's always attempting to prepare you, and God's cre created helpers, other people who have already been there before you, and even environments in order mm. for, for you to reach a new condition and, and understand that that's a preparatory stage for the next condition. Yeah. And one of the things you realise when you're progressing properly towards God is you realise that every stage you go through is a preparatory stage for the next stage you're going to go through. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so it's a wonderful system, really, that, yeah, that and God's made. Sorry, darling, I cut you off. Um, uh, I see her reflecting this. I feel it's, it's very humble to have that perspective of our progression. Mm. Um, many of us have the tendency to be self-punishing about where we're at in mm. terms of our development mm -hmm. in love, which only distracts us and actually does nothing to improve our condition in love. Mm. It's actually an avoidance of really facing where we're at. Yeah. Or we like to perceive that our condition in love is way, way better and we get caught up in the facade. And it's a very humble thing to recognise where I am right now without fanfare or self-punishment and just to keep moving from where I am to, to where I'm going mm. with this honest, earnest aspiration to grow, of course. But that, I see her reflecting this humility in many different ways in this mm. chapter. But also, as she points out, to enjoy the process. Yes. We don't see many people enjoying the process. It's mm -hmm. like, and, uh, you know, it is understandable when the process begins that there's not a large amount of enjoyment because, you know, there is a lot of things to let go of mm -hmm. in the process to, before you can start enjoying things. But once you reach the top of the first sphere, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. generally you start enjoying the process. <laughs> And this is another indication of a person reaching that place or that location is that there is a tendency then to begin enjoying the fact that you're learning new things and enjoying the fact you're not so afraid of learning everything like you were before. Yeah. And in fact, you start going through the terrors and fears that you had about learning, about, about growth, about making mistakes and all of those things. And, and you give up the concept that, oh, you've made a mistake and it's unrecoverable because yeah. you know that everything is recoverable. And so for these reasons, you, you have far less fear engaged in the process of your growth. And the beauty of that is that you end up growing with a lot more joy through the process mm -hmm. rather than feeling like, oh, I just want the end, I just want the end, and, 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 and not enjoying the middle bit, which yeah. is actually very important for your growth. Um, Absolutely. It's yeah. how we come to experience ourselves mm. and to know ourselves and mm. to understand our personality and all of its intricacies mm. is this whole process, yes. isn't it? So after a while you start enjoying that process yeah. and I suggest to people if they're not enjoying that process, they've yet to go through what she described in her, in her poem. And yeah. she said, where, where she's safe from all the storms and tempests, yeah. right? Hushed the discord and the strife stilled the heart with its wild beatings, calmed the hot and fevered brain. Yeah. These are all the states that we are often in before we start to enjoy yeah. <laughs> the yeah. process of going, working towards God. And, 
And once we reach the place, you know, usually it's that transition between the first and the second sphere where these things start all calming down with us and we have a calmness about the fact that we know we've got injuries still, we know we've got progress to make, but we're a lot more calmer about it and we, and we feel a lot more like everything's in harmony and we're being led and we have a lot more trust and we're not so worried about avoiding the storms and the tempests that might be in the future and so forth that's when we start to feel safe in the process yeah. and that's when we start to have real faith in God and real trust that God is good and and when we reach that stage generally that's when we have a lot more relaxation in the process mm -hmm. we but we also progress faster because we're, we're when you're a bit more relaxed you, you have a large uh, uh, usually a, an op more openness to learn and that's why we progress faster generally in that state. Before then, we're so afraid and we're all in turmoil and we're upset, sometimes angry. There's storms coming along, there's, there's grief, there's all these other feelings to feel. And as a result, we are frequently feeling down and depressed and, and, and not feeling much happiness. Yeah. But you get beyond that point yeah. where you get to this place where you start feeling the joy of learning new things. You're feeling the growth and feeling the alleviation, if you like, of the storms of the past yeah. um, and, and while they're not all gone you still have more emotions to feel you will have at least some happiness and joy in the process then yeah. and that's what is very striking in this chapter about Alil's demeanor is that she's relaxed she's full of there's no problem or issue that can waver her from her feelings of faith in God and that that this process is leading to somewhere good Mm. Uh, she has that um, sense of calm. Mm. Yes. Okay, so she engages in a bit of discussion with Frederick now mm -hmm. about logically the idea that since God is infinite, it, progression is probably going to be infinite. Correct. <laughs> which is true as far as we understand it. Um, There's so many logical discussions you're going to have about that all stem from God being infinite. Yes. Like the same goes with God's word. There's no such thing as God's word in terms of a physical written word because it makes sense that if God's infinite, there's an infinite amount of truth to share us yep. and therefore there is no completed written word. Yep. You know, there's so many like things that, I, that I've realised very rapidly in my own progression, um, but all based around the understanding and feeling the truth that God is infinite. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. It's, a, it's a, such a fundamental thing that will help you understand so much truth if you, yeah. if you can accept that. Yeah. yeah. Then she goes on to, she's sort of hypothesising now from the point that she's at, but she said something that I'd like to discuss with you. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think it will be almost necessary for the remembrance of our earth life to pass away before we can bear to look upon his face. And Frederick says, what do you think? You're like, we're going to lose our identity. And she's saying, no, 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 that can't be possible. Um, but this idea of the remembrance of the earth life passing away mm -hmm. and what I feel about when I read that is the sin that leaves us. And it, as we progress, the sins that we've committed on earth have to leave us emotionally. And in a sense, all of our investments and everything that was unloving that bound us to the earth is actually gone from us. Mm. So it can almost feel like, oh, that life I had back on earth, it's like a distant memory. It's not gone from me, but there's no longer this being bound to the earth. Yeah, perhaps we could say it a different way so people yes. understand. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, no, I feel that's clear enough, but yeah. there's, a, there's another way you could say it that would help people understand what it feels like. Yeah. And that is that when you uh, are on earth or you leave earth initially, you still have a lot of emotions tied to your earth-based experience. Mm -hmm. So these emotions are often, like they're varied, you know, some of them are joys that you've enjoyed on earth, but some of them are troubles and trials that you've had on earth as well. They're all emotionally imprinted upon you. Mm -hmm. Once you release them emotionally, you get to the point where the memory remains, but the emotion of the memory no longer remains because yeah. you've released it. Yeah. And since the emotion of the memory no longer remains, you are now not bound to the experience. Yes. So in other words, you no longer judge the experience through the emotional filters that you had when you were having the experience. 
So, so once you become at one with God, you're in this state where you remember everything in your life. In fact, you remember everything usually quite clearly and if it's recalled to you. But because there is no emotion tied to the memory anymore, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to forget the experiences as well at times. Yeah. yeah well, they're not as relevant. They're not weighing on your soul. They're not things that you want to engage in anymore. So it's almost like you can... And there's let... no trauma associated with them. Yeah. And there's no major sort of happiness in comparison to the happiness you're now experiencing. Yes. So, so everything is like a dim, it, it's like not only dimmed in terms of the distance of time, yeah. but it's dimmed in terms of you now have no emotion associated with it. And it's also now dimmed in terms of the significance of your entire life. Mm -hmm. So, so, if, so it, we find it interesting when people question us about our lives, for example, because we've had 2000 years of life and yet everyone wants to question us about 30 or 40 years of it. <laughs> either the one the bit at the start or the bit now yeah. but but very little in between yeah. and i find that very interesting it shows you the focus of most people here on earth is the earth life as mm -hmm. if it is the life yeah. and it's not the life it's a very minor portion of the of the gestationary period of your life yeah and and so of course over you know thousands of years of experience it will be just a dim memory even in terms of distance, yeah. but if you release the emotion, mm -hmm. it will be completely a dim memory in terms of the emotional experience. And this is what she means by, yeah. I feel forgetting or um, no longer the necess necessity for the remembrance of our earth yes. life. We, we still remember the experiences as experiences, yeah. but we don't remember the feelings so much anymore. Yeah. Um, as, a, as an emotion that's still within us. Yes. A lot of times now people on earth think back with nostalgia about the past mm. and the reason why is because there's huge amounts of emotions tied into their past. Unresolved, Unresolved. emotion, yeah. Mm. Whereas that's not what happens in the spirit world. You don't think back nostalgically to your earth life because the life you're enjoying now far exceeds the happiness you had then and on top of that you've re let go of all of the strife, trouble and emotions that you felt during that period. Yeah, that, if you are progressing, that's yes, what happens. Yes, if you are progressing. And that's what she's, she's even hypothesising at this point because she hasn't experienced this. No. But she's saying, look, by the time we reach at, um, at one moment with God, if mm -hmm. we say that. Which is what she's basically she's sort describing. Of perce perceiving she's going to meet you, who's the person she knows to be at Christ God, or yeah. at one with God. Um, then she feels like we're probably going to let go of even the remembrance of, of the earth life. And yeah. um, there is a great Paget message also that talks about forgiveness and forgetfulness, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. And that's what I think about a lot is this idea, as I repent and as I forgive, there is a letting go of my attachment to all of those memories mm -hmm. and those people. Mm -hmm. There's still, as you said, that I still retain the knowledge of them, mm -hmm. but there's not this... Um, the emotional imprint. Emotional energy caught up in mm. that memory or that experience anymore. Mm. And I feel that she's hypothesising along a good train of thought. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Obviously, she's also had teachers te teach her this. Yeah. She's had pe other people express to her by this stage yeah. that this is the direction she needs to take if, if, she's, if she's going to become at one with God at some point in mm -hmm. her future. Mm -hmm. Also, it's important to note the comment about not losing the identity. Yes. And I feel, I feel that a lot of people think of spiritual development. In fact, the whole Buddhist line of development is this whole concept that you become one with all things and you, you somehow lose your personal identity. Mm -hmm. You lose your personal personality. This is not the case. In fact, in fact, it is completely the opposite to the case. God designed you to be a full expression of your own personality. And in fact, as you do such a thing, you become closer and closer to what God designed you to be. And so as you grow, you will more fully express your personality, not suppress it. Yeah. No, you, you won't be coming at one with all things in the sense that you in your identity is lost but rather you will have a very firm set idea of who you are and your own personal identity. You will be at one with all things in love but not at one with all things in identity. And I feel that uh, this whole concept that a person becomes at one in identity is a very false concept that causes people to attempt to detune 
from their personality and their emotional experience and from their desires. And in fact, there is this encouragement in a lot of theology now, mm -hmm. and particularly Buddhist type of background theology, that you need to detune from your desires in order to progress. And this is not true. You need to tune into your desires and bring them in harmony with love, with God's yeah. love. That's what you need to do instead. Yeah. And there is this idea that when we are perfectly loving, we're all going to be acting exactly the same, like robots. And yeah. that's completely discounting the idea of unique personality and creativity and desire. Correct. Because we can have many, many, many desires that are in harmony with love. Yes. And uh, I think there, because love is not demonstrated in a true sense very often or very well on the earth, uh, people don't have a good conception of that. No. And so no. they think, oh, everyone is going to be all loving when they're at one with God. They'll all be doing exactly the same thing. And it's not like, not that, like that at all. At all. No. In it's, fact, the love best parties are the ones of the after, atmosphere yeah, and above. The best parties, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and, and the other thing that we need to bear in mind is that you become more expressionful of your personality and nature. So, yeah. so how would you then, like, how would you then be more suppressed? Like, yes. It's impossible for you to be more suppressed. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel yeah. quite strongly that most people who... Ha most people seem to have this idea of a Earth of two types of theology almost. There's this theology of you pass and you're instantly with God and, and there's no real concept of what you're doing mm. <laughs> at that point. It's almost like you sit there playing harps, as the yeah, saying yeah, goes, yeah. and... You know, everyone sits around and sings and lasers around or something, and that's not the case at all. And, and does it? Yeah. Right, and then right. there's this other concept, which is, oh no, you become at one with all things, and you now no longer really exist like as yourself, but you're now in harmony with everything and conscious of everything and everyone. And while there is a degree of truth in that, it doesn't mean that you lose your personality, nature, or individuality. And in fact, God created the entire process of your incarnation in order for you to come to understand your individual nature yeah. Yeah. and and that nature in terms of as a part of the expression of God's personality and nature mm. in that the a lot of our personal nature we can then reflect upon and go ah oh, I can feel this kind of nature in God as well yeah. so sometimes when I meet my brothers and sisters go there's a nice man he's got that very you know unique sort of nature and they, oh, I can feel that in God as well you know that same uniqueness as this person has yeah. um, but it doesn't mean that God and he are identical. No. They're not the same individual. No. Yeah. 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 Ah, okay. And now she goes on to talk about some of the things that we've already been talking about. Um, I was she, thinking perhaps we should, we should have a, a bit of a break yes. for five minutes so we can <laughs> go, to the go to the toilet and so forth because there's still quite a number of, uh, of pages left yeah, in the book, is, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Yep. And we need a rest. So let's just yeah. have a quick yeah. break and we'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're continuing on with the discussion of Chapter 17 after our short break. Mm -hmm. And we've, we're up to the point in the chapter where... Um, Frederick and the poetess are discussing progression. Mm. Mm. And, and also we talked a bit about, you know, is your identity lost? Do you lose your, you know, your personality or nature and all those kind of things? That's right. Mm. That's right. And um, she's about to draw two analogies uh, about progression because Frederick, as usual, is full of questions like, what's going to happen? How's it going to happen? What do mm -hmm. you think about this? What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Which is one of his beautiful qualities of mm -hmm. curiosity. Yes, yes. But she says to him quite firmly on a couple of occasions, um, she says she compares the, um, the process of progression to a blind person who's becoming accustomed to the light mm -hmm. and that God wouldn't want to overwhelm us with this piercing light as we're coming... Uh, Post-surgery after blindness mm. is really what she's saying. Yes. So she draws that analogy and then she talks about this period where she feels she's in this period of waiting and she says, well, I'm something like a child who recognises his inferiority to a man 
but the consciousness thereof by no means lessens his present joy. Mm. So again, it's this process where she feels like she's in a period of growth, but she's very happy. Mm -hmm. And um, she feels that she's being cared for in that she's not suddenly being overwhelmed um, with gifts that would be too overpowering, as she puts it. Mm. Uh, I suppose I have some... Um this concept that people are not used to being overpowered, I suppose, is, is yeah, interesting. Let's talk about but, that. but the reality is the soul does need to allow to be allowed to be expanding. Mm -hmm. And the only way the soul does expand is by being overwhelmed. But but you can overwhelm something too much. In other words, you can try to put something into it that it's not got the capacity to even expand to at any one point in time. Yeah. And, and this is what God constantly does, is God's trying to help us grow and allow and wants us to allow ourselves to be overwhelmed. And of course, when we receive God's love, every time we receive more of it, we will be overwhelmed. But, but God also knows that God can't inject us full of God's love instantly as an instant progress. So there is no such thing as instant progression. Mm -hmm. So all these people on earth who believe in instant progression, instant change, well, you know, there's these, there's particularly new age metaphysical stuff. There's this belief that you know you somehow somehow have this epiphany and all of a sudden everything's different, and that's not the kind of change that actually happens at all, unless you're overcloaked by a spirit, you know, and and have completely disowned yourself in the process. The real change that happens, and the real change that will happen forever in your life if you allow it, is this constantly being overwhelmed by each new thing that God exposes to you mm -hmm. and you if you as long as you allow the process of being overwhelmed you you will always grow now she's basically saying that that she realizes that it's like that yeah that she realizes that god's god can't feed everything in an instant yeah you know and uh, there's another saying in an, uh, another part of the, these books that you know can't turn can't turn the sinner into an angel in, overnight, overnight. <laughs> yeah which is very, very true yeah. because it, it requires a lot of growth which is based around emotional feelings and processing of feelings. Mm -hmm. And anything to do with processing of feelings takes time. You yeah. can't expect it to be instant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. I was just looking in the text there. about She's <coughs> talking about, um, you know, that God's too wise to allow any possibility of disaster in this process. Of course. So it's a, it's a process of... Um, natural growth that she's saying yes yeah. but also it's important to note that and it might not it might be something she's realizing at this point that yep. her very soul is designed a certain way mm -hmm. and the soul itself is designed in such a way that it cannot be overwhelmed to the point of crushing it yeah um you know it's a, it's a physical impossibility that god's designed into the process mm -hmm. so so we don't have to be afraid of being overwhelmed so much that we die or so yes. much that we become psychotic or so it's yeah. only when we shut down the process that those particular things uh, are going to occur so and if we trust an god point. and god's design yeah. everything will go smoothly and progressively as soon as we don't trust god's design and as soon as we try to control the process now we are in danger of uh, of denial, suppression, and even psychosis and other problems that are associated with growth or potentially associated with too much growth yeah. are all the results of our own suppression rather than our acceptance of God's way of growing. Yeah, and she has such a strong faith in, in what's happening. Mm. Um, and she has this deep desire to grow. And mm. so she says that... Um, she has a great desire to meet my father, meet her father face to face. Mm. But that doesn't diminish the pleasure of where she's at. Correct. And I suppose, again, it's just this demonstration of her attitude, a faithful attitude, mm. and one where she has actually reached this waiting place and has begun to progress through the second sphere where fear is not dominating her. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. like she says, every step she takes towards God becomes another messenger to me, bearing some fresh revelation. And that's exactly what it's like, isn't it? You, yes. Once you're progressing, every new step bears a fresh revelation 
that that is just amazing and you've got to go through the pro emotional process of accepting it like <laughs> of coming to terms with that new revelation that you didn't have before and 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 once you're happy in that process mm -hmm. it's uh it's like you're always like over overwhelmed but in a joyful way yeah. about what's going on rather yeah. than uh, in a very resistive way and and i find that this whole like the concept of resistance to growth is usually a concept that remains with us because we've not yet reached that state at the top of the first sphere where we start to accept that growth is going to be a part of the rest of our existence. Yes. And so the reality is that if we are resisting growth too and we, and we are afraid of it, then we've yet really to make that transition into fully accepting and trusting the way God has designed this entire system, the way God's designed the soul and the way God's designed knowledge that flows emotionally yeah. and all of these things. We don't understand any of those things yet. Mm -hmm. And if we allow ourselves to understand that, we'll have some faith maybe that that <laughs> ha will happen as yeah. well. We need to have faith that that is a state we'll eventually obtain mm -hmm. where we start to really trust God and really have faith that this process that God's leading us through, as long as we engage in it willfully, yeah. it, it will come to its appropriate outcome, which will be, you know, we'll become at one with the creator, the, 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 the parent who created us. Yeah. Um, it's only when we resist and suppress and deny that process that we run into strife and pain. And that's the, the that's the state that crushes our faith really doesn't yes. it as yeah. I mentioned earlier yeah. and we can as you said we can have faith that we're going to reach a one with God but also have faith that if we are humble where we are right now we're going to even reach this state where she's at which is only you know that's that's a part where the journey becomes more joyful. Yes. Everything is a new unfoldment. Every time she's overwhelmed, she receives a new truth from God. There's yeah. more love. She feels it's a wonderful process. Yes. Instead of dreading the lessons and the overwhelm, she's embracing them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that can happen much sooner than our at one with God. Correct. It doesn't need, we don't need to be at one with God to enter the joyful, that joyful state of, of embracing new things. Yeah. And, and being open to the being overwhelmed emotionally with every new thing we discover. We, we can, in fact, we can get to the stage where that state is so enjoyable that, that if we're not progressing, it feels, it feels terrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when, yeah. When, when, when we're not making these changes, that's when it feels terrible. Yeah. Mm. I, you, that's when you feel disconnected from yourself rather than connected. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So normally when we start this process on earth, we feel very frightened of this kind of state where we're overwhelmed and so we only allow it in very small time frames. Whereas as we go on, we start to feel like, oh, I don't like being disconnected anymore, you know. <laughs> I, I wish I could allow this. And, and you do finish up using your soul, you know, your desire, your, your will to, to enable that kind of state more frequently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, just beautiful messages about faith and progression all mm. the way through the chapter, isn't there? Mm. Um, she references a few hymns in here that I just thought that I would mention just for the reader. Um, she says, God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. So this is in response to um, <laughs> so that's a that hymn, question. Yes. That's a hymn. Or a quote from a hymn. Uh, it's yeah. a quote from a hymn. Yeah. Um, by William Cowper, yeah. called God Moves in Mysterious Ways. It's quite famous. <laughs> yes. And it's a saying that many people use. And, yeah. uh, you know, God isn't as mysterious as perhaps people make him out well, to be Well, I feel earth. for people on earth, God is mysterious mostly because we're not connected with God and we're often resisting God and we're often suppressing the process God has us in. But once we understand the process more, it doesn't feel as mysterious as, you know, the average person on earth probably believes it to be. Yeah, mm. yeah. And the other thing, the other, there was just a bit earlier, um, talk she mentioned, oh no, Frederick mentioned that um, those who wait, um, those also serve who only stand and wait. And so um, he was talking of her in this waiting place. Mm -hmm. And that actually comes from a sonnet by John Milton, mm -hmm. written in the 17th century, mm -hmm. uh, called On His Blindness. And if anyone's interested in that sonnet, they can have a look at it. <laughs> it has some other biblical references in it as yeah, well. Yeah. 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 Okay, so let's keep going. 
So now Frederick's asking about his one great passion, mm -hmm. uh, which is to return to Earth and to mm. share what he's learned. And he feels so strongly about mm. doing this, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And he asks her what she would want to teach. Mm. And can do you see that in the text there? Do you want to um, read about that? Let me find it if you... Yeah. She says here, you might be, I'm summarising here, you might be a little bit surprised to know what I would first want to teach given that I was a writer on earth. But this is what I would say. Oh, yes, there is. Yeah. One of the first lessons we have to teach on our return is that the word of God can never be printed in a book. Yes. God is and his word is like himself, an ever-present, ever-living, moving power. Infinite, I would add. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What is written can never be more than a historic record of what was the word of God to Moses, Samuel, David, Isaiah or Paul. Mm. So, yeah, that's a, a, a really big truth that she really wants to, to have known by everyone. Yes. And, and, and when we, like, we often get a lot of people, like Christian people, really upset about, you know, our... our inability to honour the Bible as the complete and final word of God. Yeah. Um, and when we try to reason with them on this particular subject of God being infinite and so forth, it, it, it's like completely falls on deaf ears. Like yeah. There's no logical reasoning in these people. And I find that interesting and it's driven by very, very dark and, and very harsh emotions actually. And it's this emotion that they want there to be a... No, never changing word so that they can just do what it says. Mm. Like they feel so frightened of experimentation, making mistakes and those kind of things because it, obviously it's a life and death issue for them. They're taught that from their own word. Yes. That it is a life or death issue. If you do the wrong thing, you're going to die and you might be in hell for the rest of your existence. Yeah. And, and because of these threats of eternal state, in other words, you either have an eternal good state or an eternal bad state, um, rather than there being an acknowledgement of permanent progression, mm. there is this deep ingrained fear, so strong in most people who are connected to a holy book, that they're unwilling to even re uh, Hypothesize reason or, logically yeah. that actually God being infinite means that there can't be a book that contains the, the word of God. Full stop. Full stop. Yeah. And, and it's such a sad thing that these emotions, which are all coming from threats of a God that doesn't exist, mm. they're basically threats that come from the imagination of men, of humankind, used to manipulate and control masses of people, uh, as, uh, as someone who says, the opium of the people. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Religion is the opium of people. And it often is. It causes people to go into this state where they cannot any longer use any reasoning even about mm. what they are teaching. And, and because they are so frightened to make a step different to what the book they have been told is the book yeah. um, that they must trust, they are so frightened to make a step away from that that, that it causes them to be completely disclosed to any logical reasoning whatsoever. Yeah. And I find that's a, that's a terrible state to end up in because you can stay in that state for hundreds of years in the spirit world. And, and many we know have stayed in there for thousands of years in the spirit yeah. world, adhering to a book or adhering to a certain teaching only to find out after a thousand years of hear, adhering to it that the teaching that they should have adhered to was the teaching of love yeah. and not this concept that God has some kind of finite capacity. Yeah. And, and in a way, it's blasphemous towards God. Yeah. You're basically saying that because you're basically saying God's infinite on one hand, but on the other hand, that God's word is finite. Yeah. And that cannot be true. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is a, the, it's totally illogical. And, 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 and from, a, from a mathematical perspective, unable to be uh, like verified you, yeah. you, can't, you can't say that some that a source of information is infinite and then the information that he gives is finite yes you know it makes sense that if the source of the information is infinite so too must be the information that he gives yes and and so this concept of holding on to a book 
in order to maintain some kind of state within yourself where you, where you feel safe and, and secure mm -hmm. is a very dangerous state for your future. Mm -hmm. Because not only will it keep you where you currently are, yeah. but it also prevents you from acknowledging this very huge truth about the universe, and that is everything in the universe will eventually grow. It yes. has to change. It yes. has to be converted from one thing into another eventually. Yeah. And, and it's a major truth of the universe that needs to be accepted. And, and yet I find that people who adhere to a book in such, in, in such a strong and dogmatic and often violent manner, yeah. um, uh, they are so afraid of this truth. Mm. And yet it is such a beautiful truth. The fact that you'll be infinitely growing. It is. It's, it's, she says it very beautifully here uh, in her poetic way. Mm. She says, It is like a well of water continually, continually bubbling up. She's talking here about mm. the Word of God. Not a stagnant pool that for 2,000 years has maintained a dead, unvarying level. Mm. Men have to learn that he speaks today if they will but listen as much as he ever did. A printed book only traces the course of the stream in the past. It cannot show the broadening revelation of the present and only faintly indicates the idea of future boundless love. Yes. This our brethren on earth have yet to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and with it they will recognise that the ordination of the ministry of angels is the everlasting channel through which the word of God must flow. And this is what I feel like. Yes, this is so important to learn. It's such an important uh, thing to understand. And, and I encourage every single person who adheres to a book mm -hmm. to think of the logic of these statements and go, yeah. well, okay, yes, how can the printed book not contain anything other but just traces of the past? Yeah. It doesn't contain any revelation for the present. Mm -hmm. and, and it cannot show what the idea of the future will be. It cannot because yeah. it's not, you're not there yet. Yeah. And, and it's so unfortunate that people become so bound up by these kind of teachings and doctrines. My own family is totally bound up by this kind of principle that the Bible is the, is the only word of God. And as a result, it's impossible for them to become more loving yeah. than they currently are. Yeah. And that's Very what sad. she says, that this is the gospel of Christ, what she's just said or yes. what you've just said. The gospel of redeeming love. Yes. And Frederick again is saying love, this love, it's everywhere, you know. Yeah. Um, everyone's talking about love and that everything, and she's saying, yes, everything here is based on love. Yes. The architect of every home, the subject of every prayer, the, you know, yeah. it, it, in, it gives life to everything in yes. the spirit world. Yeah. So then he asked, well, so you're basically saying that love would be the theme of your ministry. Yeah. <laughs> and she says, of course, that was, that was the theme of Jesus when he spoke. Yep. And of course, you know, following my, my teachings, um, it would be the only theme that anybody else could speak about in the end. Because it is the only theme of truth that exists no matter where you go yeah. in, in this, on earth or in the spirit world. Yeah. And, and as a result, it is, it is the thing that needs to be taught above all other things. Yeah. Mm. And she says, very poetically again, you know, it's the bread that should feed the hungry. And mm -hmm. she says something um, quite significant, I, I feel. She said, I would use it as the key of hope to release the prisoner of fear. Mm. And that is so true, isn't mm. it? That faith in love is the thing that, eventually unlocks us from fear and, and causes us to choose something different. Yes. Yeah. Like she says, fear, punishment and retribution I would hold in long restraint <laughs> <laughs> while I tried to charm the, each wanderer homeward as I sang the legitimate music his father composed to win him back from sin and misery to his rightful home and heritage. Yeah. It's sort of like, and this is the problem we see as well, isn't it? That fear, punishment, retribution is the general theme that we notice in particular in terms of what's said to us from people who are, who are practicing the Christian faith yeah. and, and not love. And in fact, it's like most of them have no understanding of love at all. And in particular, the ones who email us, yes, it seems we say they, we, they we are seem usually to. violent in their yeah. tendencies and nature and so much so that they're willing to actually perpetrate violence and, and even wish for our death. Um, and this is an indication 
of how much fear, punishment and retribution they've imbibed inside of themselves. And, and they believe this about God. They believe that they're actually doing God a favour mm -hmm. by threatening us with death. By threatening someone who's teaching about love with death. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that's, and, a, and so in, in this regard, they become an enemy of God's teachings, yeah. not, 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 not a person who supports them. No, yeah. exactly, exactly. And this, this metaphor, she says that love is the legitimate music that God composed yes. to win us back from sin and misery. Yes. That I, it's just so full of poetic truth, mm. this chapter. Yeah. That, um, it's, it's very beautiful. Yes. Um, so it's a very good conversation that I've had, really, because yes. it's about... Uh, what, what you would call as theological doctrinal issues mm -hmm. are all sort of dispelled or put aside temporarily for the sake of seeing the more important issue of love. Yeah. And, and so it should be. Mm -hmm. um, theoretic, you know, theological and doctrinal issues should all be put aside yeah. when the more important issue of love come, uh, uh, needs to be brought to the fore. Yeah. And, and always, always emphasised. Yes. Um, and this is where I feel um, once the religions of the earth make that transition, then we have some hope for the future on earth. Then we have some hope to see changes on earth. Mm. Once we change this concept that we have from the fear-based, retribution-based, punishment-based God to a God is only love and who wants us to demonstrate love ourselves and learn about love ourselves and learn what love is. And once we make this transition mm. from the, the theoretical man-based, man-created dogma and theological discussion into the God-based, love-based discussion, now we have some ability to progress. And this is something I feel a lot of uh, people who come to our seminars miss mm -hmm. because they often ask question after question after question about theoretical things or, or, or things about truth, yeah. but they miss practicing love with each other while they're there. And quite often we see yeah. people come to our seminars and they ask all these questions. The seminars about love and all, and, and all mm -hmm. the aspects of truth, they come to the seminar and then the very next moment they treat the next person who's sitting right next to them without any love yeah. and they, they've missed the entire point of their entire future progression. Exactly. And, and this and is something we need to address. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Good. Uh, that's something I often feel when I see people uh, questioning you quite insistently about issues regarding the spirit world or uh, one went with God or all these things. When even in this example, in this chapter, the poetess is saying to us, you can't really understand till you get there anyway. So mm. I'm not trying. Mm. I'm just working on the lessons of love that my father is bringing me right now. Well, the irony is the lessons of love is how you get there anyway. Which is the way, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which, you know, which is the way that I'm actually going to come to know these things yes. in the future about my progression. And yes. that is the thing that... And maybe it's because we're fear-based and intellectually dominant on the earth, mm. but most people miss that in, they're in search of truth and facts when they're missing the point that if we grow in love and this relationship with God, all truth, all and, truth facts. and facts come to us, but they, they can take hold in this fertile ground of love that we've developed. Mm -hmm. And the respect that this is born of that love within us that we have for our environment and everyone around mm -hmm. us. Yeah. yeah. So I find, I find it a bit sad sometimes when we uh, finish up with our seminars, when we observe so much unloving behaviour going on. Yeah. There is little, you know, we don't control people, obviously, at our seminars or presentations, so it's up to them what they do. Yeah. But, but to, to see people, you know, treat other people so unlovingly, and yet these people have listened to the principles of divine truth for years, yeah. they obviously have missed the lesson, the, mm. the main lesson, the primary lesson, which is it's all about growth in love. And we've talked about it so many times that it seems to go over people's head. It's like, yes, but, you know, you, yeah. you, you, you talk, start talking about love and they go, yeah, I'm not interested in that. Yes, but I want to know about this, yes. you know, what happens when you die here and what happens when you go there and what spirit, why did the spirit say this yeah. and why did the spirit say what that? Emotion what emotion that? is that? Even. What emotion yeah. is this? And, and there's no focus on the love that needs to be displayed, even in the questioning. Yeah. And, and so this is something that we're 
wanting to focus more, far more attention on. Mm. And we're becoming a lot firmer about it as well. We, and most people are very challenged. Like every time we draw the line in with love and say, no, that, that, that what you just did there is not loving and we're not going to engage you unless you learn that lesson of love anymore. And they get up in arms and say, how dare they do that and carry on and carry on. And all we're trying to do is demonstrate to people, no, this is a principle of love that you don't want to get. Yeah. And until you get it, we don't want to share any more with you until you get that principle. Because if you don't get that principle, there's nothing more we can share mm -hmm. with you about love. And if we ignore principles of love pertaining to ourselves or to others or even a person's treatment of themselves in favour of information, yes. we miss the point ourselves. Correct. We're not demonstrating what we're teaching either. Mm -hmm. We're not living that way. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, people should be able to recognise that already we've been doing this for over 12 months now and as a result a lot of people who were listening to us no longer do mm -hmm. because all they wanted was their addictions met. All yeah. they wanted was the feeding of constant information without their having to be confronted with their own unloving state. And it's time that people who have listened to this truth now for many years particularly those people, so we're not talking about those of you who are new just listening for the first time or whatever, but we're talking about people who've been listening for many, many years. It's time that you learnt that love is the main reason why we're doing this. Yes. And love is the only progression that you can engage. There is no such thing as metaphysical spiritual progression, actually. Yeah. There is only progression in love which will bring all these other things to you. And unless you're dedicated to learning about love and all of its aspects and all and all of the and feeling through all of the unloving things within yourself, you're really it's really pointless you coming along to any seminar we present. <laughs> <laughs> and you might come along for five years, but at the end of the day it won't benefit you once one bit unless you learn this one primary truth and that is that it is all about love and growing in love yeah. and it doesn't matter how much you want to fake it there's no such thing with love about faking it till you make it you're either loving or you're not yes <laughs> and if you're not look through the reasons why look at how the soul functions and release the reasons why you're unloving so that you can get into that state where you want to love yes rather than just deny that and then want information and be a leech for information that does not benefit you unless you love. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and I was just referring to the first Corinthians quote again because it's not in that translation, but it talks about the qualities of love, love being patient and kind. Mm -hmm. But also in some translations it uses the word steadfast or um, immovable immovable mm. and and that is the truth about love yeah like if we are to love then we are going to be firm for issues of love and truth always um, and a lot of people feel that love is like a walkover and that they should be able to do well, whatever that, they want. That's addiction. That, yes. That's a walkover. <laughs> that's what they're used to having. <laughs> and while love forgives most certainly and doesn't yeah. bear a grudge, yeah. it is firm. And it doesn't itself. bend just for the sake of somebody wanting it to bend. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. bend. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how a whole spirit world takes form and shape Correct. And, and, and order and because love doesn't bend. And all we're trying to do here is demonstrate to people like how the spirit world works, you need to get used to now. Yeah. Because if you get used to it now, it'll benefit your life now. But when you pass, you'll already be in the groove. You, you'll already know, oh, it's all about love. All I've got to do is learn about love here. I've got to forget about my addictions, yeah. forget about my selfishness, my narcissism and all those other yeah. things. I've got to focus on love. I've got to forget about all this knowledge I want. I've got to focus first on love and all that knowledge will come to me. Yeah. If I do that, I will progress the most rapid, as, 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 most rapidly as possible yeah. as I can. But, but if I refuse to do that, I can listen and listen and listen. And like Paul said in Corinthians, it's just like a, a clashing plain, symbol. Yep, you know? yep. It means nothing. It's no music to anybody's ears. Yep. Um, when you've just got a whole heap of knowledge and no love. Yeah. All it is is just a whole heap of words. A whole heap of, somebody's talking, but <laughs> I can't understand anything. <laughs> yeah. That's what it really is. Yeah. And from God's perspective, without that kind of understanding, we really do not, uh, do not get progression towards God. No. We don't get it at all. And, and I feel many people who have come to our seminars still do not get progression towards God mm -hmm. as being progression in love. Yeah. They, they think all this knowledge that they've gained over many years of coming to seminars and so forth, 
means that they are now progressed. No, it does not. It just means that you now know things and can regurgitate things in your mind. That's all it means. It doesn't mean you love anymore because love requires you going through a process with your soul that you need to choose to go through if you're ever going to be at one with God. And many people who have heard years and years of information have not progressed one iota in love. They are still the same people as we met them when we first met them. Yeah. And that's sad, but it's a statement of their lack of desire to love. And that's right. It's, it's a process that engages aspiration and will and yes. desire and these very, very personal uh, qualities that are under our direct control. Yes. So while we can passively listen and regurgitate teachings, until we engage our will to want to love above addiction and above fear and above all these other things. And above our own selfishness. And above our, our comfort. Above, above our pain and our suffering. Yep. Above everything. Yep. Above our selfishness. Above our relationships. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> then we're not going to we're not going to go anywhere. Correct. Um, only within the boundaries of all of those factors that currently drive our life. Yes. Yeah. And what we see is that a lot of people give lip service to love. Mm. You know, they say they want to become more loving, but in almost every interaction they engage, they go back to their old behaviours, yeah. their old addictive behaviours. And this is not, this is an indication if, look, look, if you've heard teachings of divine truth for five years and the person who's teaching you have said, I have not seen you change in that time, yeah. you have not learned how to love in five years. Yeah. Now, you've only, there's been plenty said about love in that time, <laughs> so that means that you're resistive to loving. Mm. And what I would suggest to people in that state is to stop for a moment, about, stop trying to learn more information, yeah. and focus firmly on why are they so resistive about becoming more loving. They'll find a lot more in the answer yes. to that question that will help them in their future than answering any other question. Yeah, and I feel for many of us, we're judging that state within us. And yet if we find actually the resistance to love within us, we usually encounter a lot of fear and a lot of pain. And that is the beginning of our progression. Correct. Yeah. This connection to, I don't want to love, why? Mm. And not, in, not an intellectual process, but a feeling-based process. Yeah. Then we begin our progression, don't yes. we? And, um, and most people on earth are angry about love, let's yeah. face it. They, are, they don't want to have to love under all circumstances. What they want is people to be kind to them and nice to them, and then they'll love those people. Mm. But, but that's what, a, that's what a, like I said in the first mm -hmm. century, that's what a murderer does. Yeah. He loves the people you know, who that are kind to him, him yeah. who please him, and murders the other people yeah. who don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's not so, love. And that's not love, no. that's addiction. Yeah. That's what it's called, addiction. Yeah. And, and the reality is the majority of people believe that to be love. So just... When we learn to love, we love without addiction. Mm -hmm. We love no matter what the situation. Yeah. We love no matter what's going to happen to us personally. We love no matter what is going to happen in the future. What we think is going to happen in the future usually is a better way to say it because mm -hmm. we don't know. And, and we do that consistently when we learn how to love. And, and what I find is most people are very angry about that. They don't want to have to love when their wife's getting raped or their child's getting beaten or, or their child's being murdered. Or, you know, they don't want to love in those situations. They feel they shouldn't have to. They feel you know, very angry about that as a concept. Yeah. And in fact, when we start discussing that particular concept, that under these very difficult times, you can still love, boy, there's a lot of rage and anger that comes into the discussion from people listening generally. Mm -hmm. And that demonstrates how much opposition there is in their own hearts to actually loving the way God loves. Yeah. And that's why they haven't progressed. Yeah. That's why there's been no forward movement. And that's the emotional place to start. Correct. The exploration of those feelings in a humble and sincere way. Correct. The exploration of that rage that you feel yes. as to why you're so angry about the concept that, what, I've got to love even when somebody hurts me? Yes. 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 From God's How perspective. How does that make you feel? Yes. How does yeah. that make you feel? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've got to love even though somebody caused my pain? Yes. Yeah. I've got to love even though they did it all the time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, this is the thing that... You will learn in time. You will learn how to love that way. Yeah. But, but you need to have a desire to love that way 
that gets you through all of these emotions that you feel at the beginning. Yeah. And most people don't have a desire to go through those emotions. They don't want to come face to face mm -hmm. with the way they really are or what they really believe about love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we've often said that the core of this path is repentance and forgiveness. I mean, really, that's how we, that's what we're doing when we're dealing with our emotions. Mm -hmm. And uh, to explore why we don't want to repent or why we don't want to forgive is really important work yes um, extremely important yeah. because it's all about love we're like we repent for actions where we've taken to harm others that's about loving other people and loving ourselves and loving God and loving God's laws you know and forgiving other people when they've done things that harm us that's all about owning our own feelings owning our own emotions which is an act of love yes you know so it's all active acts of love that we're trying to encourage people to engage yeah. and most people don't who come along to the sessions don't really understand that yet they still think it's about information yeah and it's not about information. Information can help you. Yeah. It can break down the barriers of untruth. Like it, it can get rid of the lies. Yeah. It can help you with that. But it can't help you deal with the resistance and the suppression in your own soul to the belief systems of love. Yeah. So th there is, unfortunately, on the planet, large numbers of, of belief systems which oppose love. Yeah. And you've got to let those belief systems go if you're ever going to love. That's the fact. Yeah, and get really real about our belief systems being emotional. I notice a lot of people are trying to approach this whole idea of emotional exploration, even intellectually, mm. examining mm. what are my emotions intellectually, then trying to feel them and, and saying that they're longing for God's love. When If we get really real with ourselves from an emotional perspective, mm. we find that a lot of the chatter that goes on, our, in, on in our head is actually in avoiding what's really there. Correct. And um, it's that work, that, that connection with what's really there, yes. that begins our progression. Yes. Yeah. And this is where um, if everyone understood that love is the progression, mm -hmm. like, like it is the most important subject you can discuss. And what I find quite interesting in many of our seminars is that sometimes we open questions to the audience. And as you know, the majority of questions asked are not about love. They're just not about love. And yet we keep saying to people, look, love is the most important thing you can learn about. So why aren't you asking questions about love? Yeah. What does love look like? What does it feel like? What is it, yeah. what, you what know, would love, what would love would do in this situation? Yeah. What would love do in that situation? You know, these are questions that you can ask yourself about love mm -hmm. that will help you see what you do and compare what you do with what love would do yeah. or purified love would do in that situation. And, and these are the more important questions. And it's interesting with regard to um, the FAQ things that we do, very few questions are received about love, about describing it, understanding it. Now, of course, we respond to the questions that people have. Yeah. So many of the times what we're doing is we're responding to the questions you actually have. Mm -hmm. But why aren't most of the questions that you actually have about love? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. We yeah. need to ask ourselves that question. Or and even that, the barriers to love. Well, that's right, yeah. but about love or the barriers yeah. to love yeah. would be the way to go. And the main reason why is because the majority of us do not want to do it. Mm. That, that's the sad fact. Yeah. And pr the world at the moment is proof of that sad fact. Because yeah. if the majority of us wanted to love, the world would be a very different place than it currently is. Right? So, so the world is proof that the majority of us actually at this stage have not even yet developed a desire to love. Mm let alone want to know how to do it. Yeah. And so what I would suggest to people is that allow yourselves to develop a desire to love mm -hmm. and then start asking your questions about how you're going to achieve that. Yeah. Then you will make some sincere progress in your life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good discussion about progression, which is the, one of the core themes of this chapter. Mm. Now, let's finish off. Mm -hmm. There's a few... Um, a few more lessons, if you like, mm -hmm. within the chapter. Oh. So um, after this discussion that Frederick and the poetess have had about all of these principles mm -hmm. and theories that they have about progression, Mahanin returns. Yes. And um, we begin to hear a little bit about uh, Mahanin's character and his history, mm. uh, which was... It, oh, that's nice to mm. hear about that. <laughs> and that... Um, she describes him as a very pure, pure, he's very pure of heart and that he came to, 
to earth, as, came to the spirit world as a child, mm -hmm. much like these children, well, we don't know his history on earth, but mm. he passed as a child. Um, and the innocent simplicity of the child remains on him still. Mm. Um, and this childlike nature is something that has assisted him to approach so near to the master, mm. so, so near to at one with God. Mm. Um, and even I believe Mahanin at this point is at one with God. Yes, in yes. This. But yes. she's talking about how this... And so that's another lesson for all of us about this childlike nature and how far mm. that... I like the statement that they say, yes. in him we can see what sin has robbed us of, yeah. the childlike innocence and yeah. the type of soul which would be found but for our disobedience. Yeah, and what a powerful <clears> statement. It's a powerful statement in terms of when a child passes in the spirit world and you see them many years later, you often feel this childlike innocence of what, you know, that, that most people who have lived a long life on earth have lost completely. Mm -hmm. Most people who died of old age on earth have almost completely lost this childlike state. And it takes many years and sometimes centuries for some of the people to regain this state. Yeah. And we know people of our personal acquaintance in the first century who 2,000 years later have yet to regain that state. So it's just such a um, sad thing that people lose this childlike innocence. And, and obviously my Ian is a friend of ours mm -hmm. and we know him. And we know what he's been involved with in the world, and we're in the spirit world. Yep. And and what we see reflected in these books is only a minor Absolutely. part of his life, yep. um, it, because it's Fred's visits or Afra's visits with him. You that know, so are it's, uh, documented. So yes. it's one person's interactions with him yep. that that are documented. And of course, he has many uh, much a larger part of his life going on. Yeah, but. I just feel it's important for people to understand here that, again, this innocence and purity is what is going to be required in your relationship with God sometime. Yeah. And we see people stuck in their facade. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a terrible thing to be stuck in your facade because you're convinced yourself that you're progressing when you're actually not. And you've convinced yourself you're loving when you're actually not. And this is a very dangerous state. It's actually a worse state than being stu stuck in anger because at least in anger generally you can go, I'm angry and I know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? But a person who's stuck in their facade is often stuck in denial of all of their emotions of rage and anger of fear and other emotions. And as a result, they progress very slowly, if at all, even when they arrive in the spirit world. So one of the things we want to help people do is get out of your facade. Yes. <laughs> Start getting real about what you really yeah. feel and what you're really doing and how you really treat <laughs> people and what's really going on and how you feel inside and yeah. you know, get yeah. real about these things. Yes. Yeah. Like, just like a child is. Yes. When a child's angry, Child's angry. angry, you know it. Yeah. Sad. <laughs> Sad, same. Fearful. Shame, same. Excited. Everything. All of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and um, then... Fred asked this question about the difficulties between communicating between spheres in the spirit world mm -hmm. and if that's in, somehow, in some way similar to communicating between earth and the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And um, while that question is not answered fully, mm -hmm. um, he says, oh, is it difficult? And the poetess really wants to say some important things about words. And I think it's so kind of ironic that throughout this chapter, she loves words. She's mm -hmm. a poetess. She loves writing. She speaks in beautiful metaphor. Mm -hmm. But two major things she says are that words cannot, finite words cannot fully contain what God has to say. Yes. And secondly, you can derive shades of meaning from the localities and surroundings and circumstances in which you use words. Correct. So be careful about this word use thing. Correct. Yeah. You know, don't think that just because somebody said something to you that it means what you believed it means. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is a major problem. And unless you feel, you won't know the difference. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's the sad thing too. And there's a lot of danger in, again, if we look at faiths around the world, Islam, Christianity, 
uh, even reading books and things where people get obsessed with the interpretation of words yes. and lose the point of love completely, completely. or try they to even imbue argue. love into things where love was not present or yeah. don't see love. and it, Or they even argue about the words so much that they eventually become violent and sometimes <laughs> in history they've actually killed each other. About the words. <laughs> about the words. Yes. Like, and this is a sad part about human history with regard to the Christian and Muslim faith. They've actually killed each other about the interpretation of certain words yes. wow like that yeah. that is like completely get rid of love yes and <laughs> the just... main principle and then just just say oh this particular word or that particular means well oh, I've got the right to kill you now yeah. like sure yeah. like it just it's so sad that people go to that extent they will go to that extent if, if we look back at the history of the Christian faith in 300 or just after when Constantine was around, there was huge arguments. And in fact, they were threatened at one point with death if they did not conform to the eventual agreement of what of, became of the, the words. Bible. Yes, <laughs> of yes, the words. Yes. And of course, they're all false anyway. But, yes. but, but, you know, just this whole threat of death and excommunication is, is a way of using these threats as a method of controlling, and it's certainly not loving mm -mm. to do such a thing. Now, it's another, it's a different thing if the other person is being abusive or demanding or violent, then you say, look, I don't want to spend any more time with you, or if, they, you know, or if you're speaking to a, a brick wall, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. But, but you still have a feeling of love for the person. Yeah. That's completely different than wanting to kill them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, at the end of the day, even the source of most faiths that are on earth have all come from these violent beginnings, mm -hmm. which is an indication of how much we have grown away from the general principle on earth that love is the way we grow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and here, the poetess is, is sort of also trying to talk again about this theme of progression and how when we're in one state, uh, as compared to another state, whether it's on earth or the spirit world or different places in the spirit world, it's very difficult to really understand everything that's going on in the higher state. Mm. And she says, and it's a very beautiful way that she puts it, that part of Mahanin's role is to assist with the understanding between these different states. Mm -hmm. She says, um, uh, my failure to convey to you just what I desire is the very illustration I need to explain what I mean by my Hanin's forming a link between the two states of our life. Mm. So she's saying, I can't really explain everything that I want to say to you because mm. we're in different states right now. Mm. But my Hanin, part of what he's all about, mm. and as you said, we know his work in the spirit world. And he's gifted in that regard. Yes. So he, he has personality traits and learnings from his history mm -hmm. that help him to form this uh, uh, this joining if you like yep. so he he lives in the at one moment state but he spends most of his time in helping the people in the what we call preparatory state yes. you know helping them grow from that state into the at one moment state and yep. that is what he has made his life's work yeah, right. for which, the moment. Which is a very beautiful gift of service, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Um, and there's a paragraph here about progression again, mm -hmm. where the poetess is explaining progression and Mahanin really. The expansion and purification of the soul naturally elevates it. And with that elevation comes an enlargement of powers and capabilities which need to be gratified clearer conceptions of God, deeper insight into his workings, with the solution of mysteries and the capacity to discern how the complex present is working out the perfect future. So uh, these new powers and developments have to be educated so that each stage of life forms, as it were, another class in the school of eternity and as each study absorbs the whole soul of the student, you will understand what I mean by links or intermediaries like Mahanin, who hold us each to each. Mm. So, um, and we're just about at the end of the chapter, and I just thought that passage is showing us something about Mahanin and the provisions that God makes, these mm. loving provisions to help us in our progression. 
but also it's another just very clear and beautiful statement about the fact that our progression is continual and mm. gradual and growing in love and as we do we expand in many different ways and have many different capabilities mm. which is yeah. such I mean that's just such a strong theme in this chapter yes yeah. and at the closing of the chapter um, there's some more discussion about Mahanin and, and his role and uh, as a ruler, but he doesn't really rule. He's, he's, mm. a, he's a servant. Yeah, most and people on earth wouldn't understand what it means to be a ruler in the spirit world. Yeah. And there yeah. are plenty of our friends who are rulers in the spirit world. Yeah. Um, and most people on earth wouldn't have any conception of what that means because a ruler on earth is a person usually who's a despot. Yeah. <laughs> who, or someone at least with an iron fist and a very, you know, uh, forceful will, if we yes, can call it that. Yeah. Yes, certainly. And, and, and on, on, in the spirit world is very, very different. It's all ruled through the avenues of love and connecting with people's desires and so forth and waiting for people's desires to be expressed and encouraging desires in people as well and so it's a very very different process than a person who rules here on earth yeah. and as such most people who rule here on earth are not fitted to rule <laughs> in the spirit world of course for many many years if at all <laughs> yes yeah well and uh, you only need to examine some of the pageant messages of people like Julius Caesar mm. and Nero and different people who queens ruled. who ruled on earth and yeah. found when they entered the spirit world wow very different. Very different experience. Yeah, and often yeah. they are in the hills for many years expecting everyone to look up to them <laughs> while everybody's saying, well, I don't see why I should look up to you. Yeah. You're not loving at all. <laughs> so well, I, can't, I can't look up to you in, the, yeah. in that state. You know? yeah. yeah. And at the closing <clears throat> of the chapter, um, hmm. Alil calls uh, Mahanin a living exposition of the Master's injunction, hmm. he that would be the greatest amongst you the same shall be servant of all, mm. which is a reference to something that you did say in the first century and mm. can be found in the Bible, Matthew 23, 11, mm. um, which is really, do you, do you want to talk about yeah, it? Yes, certainly. I feel, again, this is one of the lessons that the majority of people who have been coming to our seminars have no understanding about at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, the majority of people who come to our seminars have, ne have I, I, I have yet to observe them serving one other person. Mm. And, and that is an indication of how like how little developed in love they are. Mm. Then there are some who serve other people all the time. You know, we have... Thought, kind of uh, unassumingly. Yes, yeah. yes, behind the scenes, unassumingly. You know, we have many, many of our closer friends are like that, mm -hmm. who, who are serving not only ourselves, but they serve the rest of humanity. Anyone who's interested in divine yeah. truth. Yeah. Well, not only that, they serve other people too, you yeah. know, the, these people. They serve people, they, they have this desire to love them by demonstrating a desire to serve them. Yeah. And, and service is a service that comes naturally mm -hmm. is an indication of the love that exists in the soul of a person. Yeah. And people who have never served or find service difficult, there's very, very little love in their soul. Yeah. And this is also another indicator of how we can measure our own progression. Mm -hmm. If, if we have little or no desire to serve in any capacity to help other people without there being some personal expectation back, in other words, with service without a personal addiction being met, service without somebody saying we're a good person, mm -hmm. service without being rewarded, and if we have little desire to engage in service of that type, then that means that we have very little love in our soul yeah. as yet. Yeah. And my suggestion to people is, Examine yourselves. Have a look to see whether you have that kind of feeling inside of yourself, whether you want to serve other people and you want to do it for no reason other than to serve them. Yeah. No reward other than that. See whether, examine yourself honestly and see whether you have that desire. Because if you do not have that desire, then there is a lot you need to learn about love. Mm. And, and as we've said, progression is all about how progressed in love you are. Yeah. So if you do not desire to serve others at all or have very little desire to serve others with a pure motive, then it means that there is very, very little love inside of you and it also means that you have not progressed very much at all yeah. Yeah. compared to the average person who... Yeah. And the, who and does we, serve. Yeah. Well, no, the, the average person on earth doesn't serve, I believe. Yeah. 
the average person on earth is selfish in their service of others yeah. or in their addictions of their service with others if they serve at all. And the average person on earth is quite narcissistic when it comes to service. And the reality is if you've listened to divine truth for years and years and yet you've still not engaged in the service of others, then you are not far removed from those people in terms of your condition in love. And if you're not far removed from that condition, you will pass where they pass. Yes. It doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how much intellectual knowledge you have. You will pass in the same condition of the other people who also have no desire to serve. Yeah. So, so I, I would it, analyse yeah. that. If, if I was a person looking at issues, I would go, OK, if I want to really know how progressed I am, Mm. Let's look at all these aspects of love about myself and how much love really drives me in my day-to-day -day life and how much I'm willing to serve others for no reward and all those kind of things. And then question about where am I? Where, where, you know, where am I in regards to God's desire for me to be? Yeah. And where am I in regards to being at one with God? What, 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 what would a one with God look like if I was truly in a progressed state? Mm. Mm -hmm even reaching this waiting place that the poetess describes would be progress <laughs> and how would my life look and feel then yes, yes. so perhaps that's one a good point for a reflection to close on mm. another point i had for reflection was just about this relationship that's demonstrated throughout the chapter again about progression and its relationship to faith and humility because mm. we see that both fred and Alil the poetess have this um, quality of humility. Mm. They're humble about who they are and where they're at. Mm -hmm. They're not self-punishing. They're not mm. self-inflating. They're mm -hmm. just here I am and I want to learn. And mm. that's a part of humility also. Mm -hmm. They're self-reflective, all of these things. And this quality enables their progression. Yes. The other quality that enables their progression is their faith in a loving God. Yes, and their desire to love that goes along with that. That goes, yes. Yeah. So their yeah. faith, you could even say their faith in love. Yes. And by extension, their faith in a loving God. Yes. Because um, both of them, they, ha they were fortunate on earth that they developed that quality while they were still on earth. Yes. And it stood them in great stead at, after they passed. Yes. And that's why they're having these beautiful experiences. Mm. And so um, I felt a point for our viewers to reflect upon would be about considering the relationship between faith, humility and progression yes. and how and let's add love to that mix as you just said if we're not progressing well it's the most important it's, our progression, that is, progression. Is, lo yeah. is in love yeah. and we're not going to do that unless we Have establish humility and faith and mm. to reflect upon some of the things that block us towards faith yeah. and that is fear, fear of experimenting anger, rebellion anger, um, <laughs> a holding on to to resentment and bitterness rather than yes. experiencing holding on to pain the, the pain of our past mm -hmm. for me that is the biggest yes. uh, issue that prevents and, faith and, and i feel probably in conclusion of the topic yeah um, what a beautiful person to give little limpy jack to to educate yeah a, a woman who understands that progression is all about love she understands that it's all about having faith in God and God's goodness. She understands that there's a whole lot of things she needs to learn, but, but she knows she's got a basis of love. And, and Libby Jack would want to be with her, yeah. like he'd want to be with her. And my suggestion to people is have a look at this. Do you want to be with people who love? Because if you don't want to be with people who love, then there's a high likelihood you don't want to love yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I feel... You know, what a beautiful thing that my and really God assigns these, uh, these yes. assignments of guidance in the spirit world. This assignment that little, a little boy, Limpy, who's died from disease, from, a, from an illness on earth. He's di in the process of dying and will go through in a later chapter of the process. Mm -hmm. He goes through this process of dying. He, he is given to a woman who understands love. She is the person who's worthy to teach him mm -hmm. because she has at least learnt something about love herself. Yeah. And this is the thing is that on earth we make, we make people with PhDs and people with degrees worthy of teaching, mm -hmm. but we don't look at the people who are loving yeah. and see them as the worthy teacher. Yeah. And, and in the spirit world, this is what it's like. The worthy teachers are the people who can teach you about love. Yeah, 
And just a very beautiful place to leave it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, hope you've enjoyed our discussion today. Yep. Uh, we'll be back next week for a discussion of chapter 18 and we'll be talking about families in that chapter. Yes, another important yes. subject for Very, your progression. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, everyone. Yeah, see you later, everyone.